I'm Neil Bakovan, and welcome back to Paleo Human Mysteries. In this episode, we move on to perhaps the biggest mystery of our cultural heritage. Why did the Neanderthals die off so quickly after we arrived in Europe? The key to unlocking this mystery comes back to the study of ancient DNA. It's just blowing the doors off archaeology and telling us things that we would never know otherwise. There are three types of DNA that can be sequenced and they each tell us some things that the others can't. Nuclear DNA has all of your genetic information. It's the three billion base pairs you've all heard about. Mitochondrial DNA is tiny. It's only 16,000 base pairs, but its cool thing is that it's only passed from mothers to daughters. Y chromosome DNA is 57,000 base pairs and it's only passed from fathers to sons. So when we have all these different DNA types, we can learn amazing things that we would never know otherwise. Just one example. Sometime between 5,000 and 8,000 years ago, people from the steppes of Central Asia, and these are Homo sapiens, Neanderthals were long gone. Well, they swept through Europe and into Spain and quickly replaced nearly 50% of the DNA of the local inhabitants. But here's the astonishing part. Almost 100% of the Y chromosome DNA was replaced and none of the mitochondrial DNA. You can take these two curves as proxies for male and female population growth. You see there's a huge constriction in the Y chromosome DNA while the mitochondrial DNA curve increases undisturbed. So what happened? What's this telling us? The simplest explanation is that the newcomers killed all the native men or at least they didn't allow them to reproduce, and they appropriated all the women for themselves. According to researchers who published in the prestigious Nature Journal in 2018, this bottleneck was at its worst around 5,000 years ago when there were, drum roll, 17 females for every male. Reminds me of the old Beach Boys song, two girls for every boy. Don't ever do that again. That's the level of apparent slaughter that went on in the male population. And that's the level of detail we can get when we have all these different DNA types. Now keep in mind that happened in our population long after Neanderthals had vanished. But I think it gives us an idea of the levels of brutality and genocide that we Homo sapiens are capable of. And DNA isn't the only evidence we have for this kind of murderous behavior. Let me tell you another related story. This one's really cool. Many of you have heard about Utsi the Iceman, whose body was found in 1991 by hikers in the Alps of Northern Italy. He was packing high tech for the time, about 5,300 years ago, including a copper ax, a bow, and arrows. And he was a styling guy. He had furs from five different animals including a bearskin hat. His is by far the best preserved body anywhere near this old that we've ever found. And scientists have x-rayed him and MRI'd and scoped his body and we've learned remarkable things. Utsi was about 45 years old when he died. He had rotten teeth, severe arthritis, parasitic worms, and gallstones. He was a wreck and his body had more than 60 tattoos. These are the oldest tattoos known to date, but they weren't decorative, they were therapeutic. They were tiny dots, lines, and X's, almost all on his lower back, knees, and ankles where he had arthritis. Many researchers believe the tattoos mark sites for acupuncture, which if correct means the practice originated 2,000 years earlier than we thought it did in Asia. The other leading theory is that the tattoos were for ceremonial healing during religious rites. All of that's interesting, but why am I bringing Utsi into this discussion? Well, after 10 years of studying the body, researchers were stunned one day in 2001 when an arrowhead showed up on an x-ray. Somehow, they'd missed it. The arrow had cut a key artery in his shoulder. Utsi didn't die from hypothermia as previously thought. He bled to death. Utsi had been murdered. <laughs> When we look back at the graph, 
His death 5,300 years ago fits exactly into the most severe part of the bottleneck. One more example is another famous skeleton many of you will have heard about, Cheddar Man, who was murdered 9,100 years ago in the Cheddar Gorge of present-day England. He also fits into the early part of this bottleneck time frame. And we'll hear more about him coming up in episode three. But I think you're getting the picture from all this that we're a pretty violent and bloodthirsty species. So finally, back to Neanderthals. Why did they die off so quickly after we arrived in Europe? As I said earlier, this has got to be among the greatest mysteries of our cultural heritage. Think about it, a whole human species goes extinct shortly after we arrive on the scene. They'd been there for a quarter million years or more. And after we show up, they're gone in a few thousand years, out of all of Europe. So what happened? Did we murder and exterminate all the Neanderthals? Well, I think that may have played a role, but there were a lot of other likely factors as well. Once we got to Europe, Neanderthals suffered a Kodak moment. That's spelled K-O-D-A-C. That's an acronym for we killed some of them, we outcompeted them, we brought disease to them, our larger population absorbed their smaller one, and the climate became much more severe. I'll get into each one of these in more detail. The K is for kill. Stephen Churchill of Duke is holding an atlatl, a spear thrower, in his right hand and a much thicker Neanderthal spear in his left. His team documented that a groove on a 50,000-year-old rib of a Neanderthal found in present-day Iraq was caused by a thinner spear thrown by an atlatl. And we homo sapiens were the only ones that had those. So we almost certainly did kill some Neanderthals. Outcompeted. Partly due to the atlatl, we probably outcompeted Neanderthals for the best food and shelters. We could hit prey from farther away. We didn't have to get so close to dangerous animals. In her wonderful book, The Invaders, How Humans and Their Dogs Drove Neanderthals to Extinction, Pat Shipman makes a good case that we had domesticated wolves for hunting and protection purposes. And they helped us outcompete Neanderthals. Another way we likely outcompeted them was through a more interwoven and rich social structure. Even though their brains were larger on average than ours, we had bigger cerebellums, the part right back here. That's the portion of the brain that helps with planning, language, and social relationships. And that better social structure is gaining ground among anthropologists as one of the principal reasons for our success and their demise. The D is for disease. Our people fresh from the tropics likely brought diseases like tuberculosis and measles for which the Neanderthals were unprepared. Bring out your days. By the way, I recently found out that about one third of the world's population today has latent TB. That blew my mind. That's 2.5 billion people. Latent means they're infected but aren't yet ill with the disease. The tropics are the cradle of most diseases due to the larger number of animal species there, and pathogens can sometimes jump to human hosts. In historical times, Cortez unknowingly brought an African slave with smallpox to the New World, and that disease, plus others, killed off 90% of the Aztec population in just a handful of years. By some accounts, 27 million Aztecs died. The A is for absorbed. We know our larger population did absorb their smaller one, at least to some degree because we carry their genes today. Probably because of their low population density, Neanderthals were significantly more inbred and they were only about one third as genetically diverse as we were. That's likely another reason that we outcompeted them and why we so easily absorbed their population. And finally, the C in Kodak is for climate. A little over 39,000 years ago, the declining Neanderthal population was hit, as was our larger Homo sapiens population, by a powerful volcanic eruption, the Campanian Ignimbrite. It erupted near Naples, Italy, and was among the four most powerful eruptions in the world in the last million years. It was big. 
It undoubtedly caused years of volcanic winters, but it also seems to have triggered the Heinrich IV event. Heinrich events are where thousands of icebergs break off from the northern ice sheet and float like ice cubes along the coast, chilling an already ice age cold Europe. It got brutally cold, and 39,000 is the youngest undisputed age we have for Neanderthal remains. So I think all these factors played a role, but I'm often asked, Neil, what do you think was the main cause? If you pin me down, I'd have to say that I think it was us because we're involved in most of those Kodak factors. We probably did bring diseases. We probably did outcompete them and we almost certainly did kill some of them. All of that's us, our doing. And as for the killing part, I think we've shown that Homo sapiens have been a pretty bloodthirsty group throughout our history. That's just my personal view, but it's backed by the fact that wherever we turned up, other human species seem to have died out quickly, including a couple of African hominids, Denisovans, the hobbit people of Flores, and maybe even Homo erectus in Asia. Some researchers believe that we've driven eight other human species to extinction. So I'm pretty suspicious that, bottom line, we were the main cause of the extinction of Neanderthals. And frankly, that makes me really sad. You know, these days we can look up at the stars and wonder if we're alone in the universe and what it would be like to meet other intelligent life forms. But we know in our past history, we did meet others. And probably because of us, they're gone. Think of what we've missed out on. The good news is that we carry a bunch of genes from these other species with us today. I guess the moral of this story is make love, not war. That does always seem to work out the best. Well, that's episode two. In episode three, we're gonna explore another perplexing mystery. Why are people from Europe, Asia, and the Americas so genetically similar? How can an indigenous Australian be more genetically similar to a Scandinavian halfway around the world than one African tribesman is to a person in a nearby different African tribe. How is that possible? So tune in to episode three of Paleo Human Mysteries. It'll blow your mind. Be sure to like us and subscribe and hit the bell that you see on the screen. Thanks.